So, yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Abhishek Nair Anil, and I'm a PhD student at Masaryk University in the Czech Republic. And I work in the lab of Dr. Martin Reichard and at the uh, Institute of Vertebrate Biology, also here in the Czech Republic. And so today I will talk about um, a specific part of my PhD program study, uh, and which we did recently, and it is to do with the role of coevolution in the success rates of uh, parasite parasitic larvae uh, from freshwater mussel uh, on multiple species of uh, betterling fish. So, as an overview, um, I I study betterling fishes and unionid mussels, uh, which um, display a very interesting relationship uh, or interaction. Uh, which is classified or defined as uh, reciprocal parasitism. Um, here, uh, both both the participants here uh, use each other um, for their own reproductive success. For the betterlings, they are obligate brood parasites of the unionid muscles, and the female, uh, which has a long ovipositor, as you can see, uh, and the female is the fish on the left, uh, uses the ovipositor to deposit her eggs into the gills of the freshwater mussel, which is further ex externally fertilized by the male. And then the eggs develop or uh, hatch into embryos and the embryos stay inside the mussel uh, mainly for uh, protection um, for uh, up to three to four weeks uh, by which they are mature enough to just swim out and live their life. Uh, on the other side, for the unionid mussels, um, their larval stage or glucidium um, are parasites onto fish, and uh, not just betterlings, of course, they, they can parasitize any fish that come uh, or swim around the vicinity of the mussel and in the water column around it. Uh, and they, it, the glucidium mainly attaches onto the fins or the gills of fish. And of course, again, they stay on the fish uh, until their, their own maturation and then fall off as live juvenile mussels. <clears throat> Sorry. So for today, I will focus on um, the, the part where the fish is um, the host and the uh, mussel larvae is the parasite. And uh, of course, now what you see on screen is just the life cycle of the Unionid muscle, it's a bivalve muscle, freshwater muscle. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, so, to give some more background on my study and what we did, uh, so betterlings, uh, because of their oviposition site, they are always swimming uh, around and about muscles, and which uh, makes them uh, quite uh, easy for uh, clochidium to attach onto. But interestingly, they are generally quite poor hosts for uh, glochidium maturation and are good at rejecting uh, glochidia in general. And uh, uh, recently, there has been an invader, uh, there's been inv invasive muscle in European uh, waterways. And uh, this muscle uh, has its origin in East Asia. Now, this invasive muscle, muscle can uh, possibly take advantage of uh, a coevolutionary lag that might be present in um, the European muscles, uh, sorry, European fishes or bitterlings that are there. And um, because of the, because the bitterlings are the most accessible fish for um, glochidial attachment, Synodonta uh, woodiana can easily uh, or could uh, easily outcompete uh, other native muscles, which are not so effective on uh, petaling fishes. So the question that uh, we try to ask or address here is how do success rates of Synodonta woodiana uh, uh, and Glochidia from this muscle vary among different species of petalings? So uh, for that, we uh, we chose four different species of betterlings, uh, two from Europe, two from European origin, and two from East Asia. And with these uh, betterlings in hand, uh, we collected mussels and then extracted the glochidia uh, from the mussels, which we then used to experimentally infect the fishes, the betterlings. 
after inf after infection um, the bitterlings were uh, placed individually in different containers as you see on screen right now well similarly uh, to the containers that are shown here and the containers or the apparatus as a whole uh, enabled us to count for two things um, uh, initially the rejected glochidia that uh, that are glochidia that were attached but then were rejected mainly by the fish's uh, immune system uh, and then uh, live juvenile mussels which are uh, again uh, glochidia that were attached on the fish but then uh, were successfully metamorphosized into the next stage of their life and then fall off, fell off as uh, live juvenile mussels. And on the bottom right, you can see how um, the parasites look on the fish. And this photo was taken um, uh, by a colleague. And uh, this was done during uh, two time points where we dissected fish. And uh, it was just a small uh, subsample. And uh, it was to um, uh, confirm initial attachment of the glochidia. <clears throat> So uh, to go into the progress of the results of the study, um, so I, I will, I'm talking about the two time points where we dissected the fish and the gray boxes that you see represent the one hour post uh, infection time point and the white boxes are 24 hours post infection and we dissected the uh, subsample of fish on both these uh, time points and uh, the gray boxes across species you can see that the data points are compared uh, comparatively similar whereas when you, when we look at the uh, white boxes or the 24 hours post infection it's quite interesting to see that there's a drop off uh, from the initial levels and even more interesting to see the fact that the East Asian species seems to have a much higher drop off um, from the initial stages when compared to the European species of petalings. Uh, so, yeah. So, next I will uh, talk about the actual number of rejected glochidia that we found over the period of 15 days. And uh, this data comes from, uh, from day four, so day four and after. And uh, during this period, we do not really see a major uh, difference between the two groups of bitterlings, which uh, kind of suggests that the, the, the only point of difference between the two uh, groups of bitterlings are really what, we, what I talked about in the earlier slide, where the initial uh, rejection of glochidia is much higher in the East Asian species of bitterling compared to the European species of bitterling which is not very um, significant here uh, after day four. So, yeah. And then finally, um, I will talk about the live juvenile mussels that emerged out of the, or off of the fish, which is basically the question, the answer to the question on the success of the betterlin, um, sorry, success of the uh, glochidia of the Synodonta woodiana on different species of betterlings. And here you can see that there's clear difference between the two groups. The East Asian species of uh, betterlings seems to be very poor host uh, compared to uh, European species of betterling, where you can see that some individuals even have uh, 200 uh, juvenile mussels coming off of them. Uh, and they, these are quite uh, significant numbers, I should say. So uh, this again points to the fact that uh, bitterlings of East Asian origin has co-evolved with uh, Cinderanta Budiana. And as I said, Budiana also is uh, of East Asian species, East Asian origin. Um, and thus they are uh, better at rejecting specific locadia and probably because they have uh, some uh, adaptations against, these, uh, against this parasite. Um, yeah, so, and uh, we also included uh, an in vitro population of Rhodius oxalatus, that's a, a betterling from China or East Asia, let's say. And this was to basically uh, separate the roles of innate and acquired immunity, uh, just so that, uh, and uh, the IVF population has never come into contact with glucidia or any tissue of muscle. So we know that uh, acquired immunity is not playing a role uh, well, a significant role in our study. 
So, um, as for discussion, um, yeah, well, uh, as I kind of pointed out earlier, glocadia or glo glocadia or glocadium of invasive Cynodonta budiana are higher, uh, have higher success rates on naive European betterling fish. And this uh, basically uh, kind of supports the evolutionary lag hypothesis where uh, the invasive species is taking advantage of the naive European betterling fish, even though betterling fish are generally uh, quite poor hosts and can reject glocadium from their, from uh, their uh, native uh, mussels, uh, mussels that they have sympathy with, uh, European species of mussels, but here uh, there seems to be an evolutionary lag. Uh, and the Budiana is, uh, seems to be taking advantage of it. And something that we maybe did not really expect to find here is uh, that maybe the key adaptation, and this is not final, but this is just assuming, uh, the key adaptation um, present in the cobalt species, that is the uh, East Asian species of bitterlings, uh, which uh, allow them to, uh, or make them uh, poor hosts for Glocidia of uh, Budiana is probably uh, their ability to reject Glocidia at the initial attachment phase, as I showed in my first result page. Um, and uh, well, uh, this I think uh, could uh, reduce the cost of parasitism, but of course I do not know that for sure right now. Uh, and maybe that's a direction in which I could uh, um, go ahead in the future. And I plan to look at um, physiology too, so maybe that's where I'm headed. Uh, so, yeah, uh, and yeah, finally, I, I'd like to thank, well, my supervisor, Dr. Martin Reichard, and everybody in the Reichard lab, uh, Iman Mehdi, who uh, was a visiting student, but helped me quite a lot and even contributed with a few pictures in this slide today. Carol, who helped me with uh, infections, experimental infections, and Adam for everything. and. Yeah, and get your Czech Science Foundation for all the monetary support and funding. Yeah, so yeah, thanks. I think that's it. Fun. Great, thank you so much for your talk. And we have time for uh, one question. If anybody has a hand to raise. So I have a question. Um, so is the Paris's Parasitism obligate in both directions? Do the bitterlings have to overposit onto the mussels and do the mussels have to develop on the fish or do they have other hosts as well? Uh, yeah, so the bitterlings definitely don't do like really are obligate parasites for mussels, but uh, not just Woodyana, but uh, most uh, bival mussels. And they have this, uh, the ovipositor that you see even in this slide, I guess, uh, is really designed to go into one of these valves the excellent tube and then the male is male pretty much knows that uh, he has to release sperm into the inhalant valve uh, and yeah basically they really have to uh, for the for the muscles um, yeah uh, i think uh, the general understanding is that they are also obligate and they have to develop on fish but i cannot say that they do not for i cannot say for sure that they do not develop on other aquatic organisms. I don't know some amphibians or reptiles, I don't know, but this is the general uh, understanding so far. Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Ashley, uh, you're up next. Sorry. Hello, everyone. My name is Ashley Webster. I'm a master's student at the University of Cincinnati in the Polak Lab. And today I'm going to be talking about um, some of my research regarding evidence for evolutionary response in post-attachment resistance to ectoparasitism in the Drosophila gamosodes mite system. Not sure. 
So uh, parasites are ubiquitous and it has been estimated that 50% of all organisms are actually parasites. Specifically those that can infect humans range from protozoa to ectoparasitic insects. And by definition, they use their host resources, making them harmful to their fitness. They can dramatically reduce growth, reproduction, and survival, and are expected to drive the evolution of defensive adaptations, specifically mechanisms of resistance. Some of the key objectives for the field of evolutionary ecology of host parasite interactions is to understand the evolutionary significance of parasitism in natural communities by identifying specific mechanisms of defense and understanding the genetic basis of these traits. My work focuses on ectoparasites, where there's a gap in our knowledge and understanding defensive traits in insects. Um, these parasites attack the surface of their host. They are important ecologically as well as diverse, ranging from ticks, lice, mites, fleas, and true bugs. They can also serve as vectors for transmissible diseases, such as malaria and chagas, and can exert non-trivial fitness consequences on their host. So the system that I have been using to learn more about host ectoparasite defenses is the Drosophila gamosodes mite system that naturally occurs in Southeast Asia. The mite is associated with different species of Drosophila, making it a generalist, and this interaction can occur on the substrate of fruit, where the mite can infect or attach to flies to breach their integument and consume their human length. By doing so, they harm their fitness and make them ectoparasitic. Something important to know for this talk is that this harm increases with attachment duration in this system as well as in others. So Drosophila have developed some mechanisms of resistance to the mite that occur at different, different phases of the interaction. So in the first phase, which is your approach or contact, in the presence of mites, they can change locomotion or use bursts of flight in order to leave the substrate or the fruit and not get infected. In the second, which is grabs, the mite is attempting to attach to the fly, but they have these behavioral defenses, such as grooming and tarsal kicking, that again allows them to avoid infection. In the third, which is attachment, they have, the mite has successfully attached to the fly, and the behavioral defenses have become ineffective, leaving them no way to remove the mite. So since there are effective and well-studied pre-attachment mechanisms in this system, I have been focused on understanding the post-attachment mechanisms that should be present due to the consequence of attachment duration on the, on the host. These may be physiological, molecular, or structural in order to remove the mite. A potential line of evidence that supports that these mechanisms are present is work that was published in 2020, where during infection, they found that RNA-seq analysis revealed substantial increased levels of host immune and stress-related genes. Roughly 1,300 genes were differentially expressed during infection, some associated with hematopoiosis, encapsulation, melanization, which you can see here, this is a mite-induced scar developed in the form of a melanized patch, as well as cuticle proteins. It was also found based on previously published work that similar responses were found with nematoids and parasitoid wasp infection. So with this work to build upon, the hypothesis was that parasitism induces a physiological mechanism that reduces attachment duration. In a prediction that pre-infected flies should have a shortened attachment duration compared to naive flies. To test this, the pre-infection design had three experimental groups. Um, these were flies that were placed into chambers, which are jars that had mites present. And those that became infected were the pre-infected group. Those that did not become infected were our exposed control. And then we also had an unexposed control. These were mites that were placed into chambers but did not have any mites present. These were held in groups for 24 hours. And then after 24 hours, all the original mites from the pre-infected group were removed while being under CO2 with fine forceps. And then the, exposed, the controls were handled similarly. And then after 25 minutes to remove any effects of CO2, our pre-infected group was reinfected with one mite, and then our controls were also infected with one mite. From here, they were all placed into individual valves and observed for detachments until the last mite disengaged from each group. And as a reminder, it is expected that the pre-infected group will have a reduced attachment duration time compared to the controls. So the first species that we tested this on was um, derived from a Philcott population of Drosophila and Melanogaster that my supervisor collected. And we actually found that the prediction failed with the, predict, uh, the pre-infected group, which is in blue, not 
having a significantly reduced attachment duration. This was based off of a survivorship curve, which looks like the detachment probability over time between the groups, as well as that same data looking at the median attachment duration, with neither of these being significant. In contrast, we found that with our next species, Drosophila malacaliani, the pre-infected group actually did have a significant reduced attachment duration time. Again, our pre-infected group is in blue. And as you can see here, the detachment probability for this for the pre-infected group has a steeper change in the probability of detachment over time. And then it also has a shorter median attachment duration time with both of these being significant um, across the groups. So this means that within the specific species, the hypothesis of an induced physiological mechanism is supported, which led to our next question, is this a mite specific response or could this be occurring due to cuticle responses when the mite breaches the fly's integument to consume its hemolymph? To test this, we had an hypothesis that the induced mechanisms are specific to my infection. Therefore, artificially wounding flies should not have the effect of reducing mite attachment duration. To test this within the species, our experimental groups had abdominal cuticle damage done with a steraminute pin under CO2 in order to mimic the damage inflicted by mites. Puncture was inflicted at 12 and 24 hours prior to infection. Based off of previous work, these are times that produce prominent physiological responses at the wound site. And our control groups were handled similarly, having contact with the minute pen, but the integument was not breached. We found that at 12 hours, our cuticle winning group, which is in pink, did not have a significant change in attachment duration. We also found similar responses at 24 hours, again, not being significant in attachment duration meaning that mere physiological damage is not sufficient to induce mice who dislodge. And the hypothesis of a physiological mechanism being induced specifically by parasitism is supported. Next, we want to address intraspecific variation in attachment duration with an hypothesis that there is genetic basis to attachment duration and a prediction that species will vary in attachment duration. To test this, we had an approach of examining six species of Drosophila that are all associated with the mites in nature. Flies using this experiment were recently derived from the field and both flies and mites were cultured under common laboratory conditions for multiple generations. And we found that there was actually a significant difference that exists across species and attachment duration. So in addition to the two species that have been presented here already, we also observed um, detachments in Drosophila atropex, Eugracilis, Bipectinata, and Parabipectinata. And as you can see, our Drosophila atropex, which is in red here, had the fastest attachment probability over time, as well as the shortest median attachment duration, while in contrast, Melanogaster in orange had the longest. So this means that it supports the hypothesis in a broad sense that there is genetic basis to attachment duration. And we can conclude that attachment by gamosodes mites induces host responses that causes mites to dislodge. This was indicated by the pre-infection experiment. However, not all species showed this effect. These responses may be specific to mites, which was indicated by the artificial wounding experiment. And interspecific variation exists in attachment duration, duration supporting the hypothesis of a broad sense genetic basis to attachment duration. By studying the precise mechanism and cost of post-attachment defenses, and the extent of genetic variation within species, there are fruitful directions or uh, future research here. With that, I would like to thank everyone who has helped me on this project, as well as you guys for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk, Ashley. Uh, questions? So you had the one Drosophila species that had the really short detachment duration, the atropex, I guess. Was there anything obvious that it was doing um, that to kick off the the mites, or you know, it was, it was yeah, just yeah, you know, watching um, no. Based on like the observations that I we make while they're attached, we're not seeing anything as far as like them having more aggressive like behavioral defenses. Um, so we're not entirely sure, which makes my data that we have found so far to be on the more like physiological background. Okay. So what are you following up and trying to look more into what the physiological mechanisms are? Yeah, so we do have that work that showed different, different genes that were differentially 
expressed. So our next step could be, for example, looking at specific genes and using like a gal system to knock those down and seeing what effects occur during attachment duration. I think cool. see okay. Sonia. White. Okay, try again. <laughs> nice talk, Ashley. Um, kind of connecting your talk to the previous talk, I was curious if um, maybe some of these interspecific differences, are they possibly due to environments? Do some of the flies maybe encounter the mites more? Do you have any information about that? Yeah, so specifically um, with Melanogaster, we know it's more of like a cosmetolan, cosmetolan species. I always mess that word up. But compared to the other ones that are more endemic to the area, so there might be some type of adaptation there. Cool. Okay. Any more questions for Ashley? All right. Thanks again for your talk. Um, so we've got a couple minutes before our next speaker starts. Um, we will we will wait until five o'clock just. Uh, for the sake of people who are moving amongst rooms. Um, but uh, who is next? So Andreas, I mean, you're welcome to, to share your screen or to share your slides whenever you want. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll give it a couple minutes before actually starting. All right, you should be good to go, Andres, whenever uh, whenever you're ready. Uh, thanks, Alex. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Andy, and I'm a postdoc working with Diana Renison at UC San Diego. And today I want to talk a little bit about some work we've done looking at possible associations between the gut microbiota and the fitness of their hosts. And we do this in big by stickleback fit. So it's quite known now that the gut microbiota is important for many aspects of their hosts, ecology and evolution. For example, 
um, gut bacteria can promote adaptation to different trophic niches. Um, one example for this would be the vampire bat that feeds exclusively on blood. And the host genome, adaptation within the host genome, but also changes in the gut microbiota together facilitated adaptation to this very specific um, and challenging trophic niche. But then also more broadly, um, the evolution of herbivory is commonly facilitated by bacteria that can digest otherwise inaccessible uh, plant materials. So yes, gut bacteria are important in this um, context. We also know that um, gut bacteria can actually affect the physiology of the host. So here's one study where what they did was to feed mice different diets, like a Western diet and a different type of diet with more fiber. And then they took the, the gut bacteria from those two different groups of mice and inoculated germ-free mice with a different gut bacteria. And then they fed those mice the same diets afterwards. So the only thing that differed was the gut bacteria. And what they found, which we see in the middle, is that um, the increase in body fat dependent on the gut bacteria. So those mice, again, were fed the same diet, just the gut bacteria differed. So the composition of the gut microbiota can affect the physiology, and in this case, weight gain of the host. And while, you know, making slightly overweight mice in the lab might be fun. Um, you know, there's not really any eco ecological or evolutionary um, implications here, but we know that in many species, there's a positive association between body size and fecundity. Um, so that means that generally larger individuals um, have a higher reproductive success. And if you take this together, the previous information that the gut microbiota can affect weight gain, this um, poses the question of whether gut micro composition diversity might be associated, associated with variation host fitness. And here, um, body size would be a proxy for fitness here. And we address this question in the three plant stickleback fish, which is very suitable for this type of question because similar to the three other species I showed you in the previous slide, there's also a positive association between body size and fecundity. And this is valid for female fish where they lay more eggs. Um, when they're larger. Also, males are able to attract um, larger females. So in both um, sexes, there's positive association between body size and fecundity. Pickleback are widespread across the Northern Hemisphere, and they have repeatedly colonized freshwater environments from uh, marine habitats. And within those freshwater environments, they diverged and adapted to the this, um, similar conditions. They're also a famous example of parallel evolution associated with those colonization events. And this gives us plenty of natural replicates to see how consistent changes are that we observe. And within freshwater environments, stickleback have diverged into, in their um, habitat use and also in their trophic niche. So there's like those benthic and limnetic fish or ecotypes, what we call them. And benthic ecotypes normally feed on associated with the bottom of a lake, feed like on larger invertebrates, where it's a limnetic, much smaller fish. They feed more in the open water on zooplankton. So this gives us like a lot of this um, axis of ecological divergence together with like plenty of natural replicates. So to kind of um, specify the questions I addressed uh, asked in the previous slide, we can ask whether there are fitness gut micro associations across such ecologically divergent populations for natural replicates. And tests for this um, for those microbiota fitness associations, we took advantage of a experimental setup um, at the University of Columbia, British Columbia at, in Vancouver, where they have those huge experimental ponds, like 25 by 15 meters. You can see in this cross section on the bottom that they um, contain different habitats. So they have like a shallow littoral zone, but also a deeper open water zone. If you remember, those pentagonetic fish are associated with those different habitats. So does this setting allows them to occupy kind of like the natural um, habitats and they can feed on different diets. And yeah, this gives us a, a, you know, a kind of a naturalistic setting. And specifically for this experiment, we used benthic and limnetic ecotypes in three different lakes. Here you can see Hudson Lake, Spruce Lake, and the Laquarie Lake. Not so important if you're not a stickleback researcher. Um, and those were raised in different ponds, in three different ponds, always in combinations of fish from two lakes um, in the same pond. And before the fish were introduced to those ponds, they were weighed and individually tagged. 
And at the end of the experiment, they were recovered. They were weighed again. The tags were recovered. So um, you could um, measure the individual growth rate of each, each fish. And when I talk about fitness in this talk, we will use, uh, use growth rate as a fitness proxy because I showed you before that larger fish have a higher reproductive output, but also um, body size is positively associated, associated with um, overwinter survival. So there's higher fecundity and higher survival if you're a larger fish. And what we did then is we took, for each population, we took like the fish with the lowest and with the highest growth rate and grouped them as low and high fitness fish. So that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest um, of this talk. And we specifically looked at two different levels of gut microdiversity. The first one is uh, alpha diversity, which is the bacterial diversity um, of an individual host. You can here see a representation of two different hosts. And for example, the one on the right is more diverse, has a higher alpha diversity because there's a higher diversity of bacterial lineages. And we predicted that high fitness fish would have a higher alpha diversity. And this is based on some studies that showed that low bacterial richness or diversity um, can be associated with poor host condition. Second hypothesis we had was regarding beta diversity. Beta diversity is a measure of dissimilarity between bacterial communities of two hosts. So it gives you an idea of how different the gut microbiome of two fish are compared to each other. And here our prediction was that um, that's something based on the, um, on a, going back to Leo Tolstoy. So we predicted that high fitness fish um, have a lower beta diversity. And um, the connection to Tolstoy is, this has been um, named the Anna Karenina principle after a book by Tolstoy, where he says that all happy families are alike, but every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And if you, you know, um, translate this to the gut microbiota, you could say that there might be fewer ways to have a functional microbiota than a dysfunctional one. And going back to our better diversity results, this would mean that there might be more clustering microbiota in the high fitness group, but if you're a low fitness fish, there might be more um, diversity or divergence in gut microbial communities. And this has been shown to be common in um, different animal microbiomes. All right, going into the results, starting with the alpha diversity results. In this graph here, you, um, you can see an alpha diversity measure called ASD richness, which is the number of bacterial lineage, basically. And what you can see is that the high fitness fish have on average a higher um, gut micro alpha diversity compared to the low fitness fish. And actually the median diversity is 63% larger. And one thing I want to mention here is that we use linear mixed effect models with pond as a random effect. And we also um, in incorporated the epotypes, so benthic versus genetic, the lake of origin, but also diet information um, in these models. And after accounting for all these factors, still there was a um, significant effect of fitness group and alpha diversity and actually fitness had the highest, uh, the strongest effect size. So it seems to be a robust um, difference in um, average um, ASD riches or alpha diversity with higher um, alpha diversity for high fitness fit. Going to the better diversity results, what you'll see now on the, on the y-axis is a measure of gut microbiota dissimilarity or better diversity, and the lower the value, the more similar um, are the fish to each other. So again, if you remember, beta diversity is a measure of um, comparisons between two individuals. And what we did here, we only limited, uh, we limited our, our um, tests to comparisons within the low fitness group and within the high fitness group. So it gives you a measure of how dissimilar fish from each fitness group are compared to each other. Now, what, you, what we see is that the high fitness fish have like a lower beta diversity. So that means that the microbiota of those fish are more similar to each other. And again, going back to this Anacarina principle, our results are in line with it. And what I mentioned before is like, if you think about a fitness landscape, so there might be many ways um, to be like a low fitness fish in terms of your microbiota. But if you wanna have like a faster growth rate, maybe only a subset of bacterial community compositions would allow you to grow faster, which is represented by this fitness peak here on this graph. And this is kind of how I interpret, how we interpret those results. So yeah, you could say that all microbiota decreasing host fitness are alike. Each microbiota decreasing host fitness does so in its own way, um, paraphrasing Polstoy. All right, um, with this, I already wanna to come to my summary. So we studied interactions between hosts and their gut microbiota and how this might affect host fitness using growth rate as a 
um, fitness proxy. In this case, we found that both gut microbiota alpha and beta diversity are associated with host fitness. In this experiment that we conducted under semi natural conditions in free spine stickleback fish. And I put semi natural conditions here in bold because I think it's important that we do those experiments in kind of naturalistic settings. Because, you know, if you think about um, selection pressures within a lab or a more natural environment, differ, but also we know that um, the environment can affect the market composition. And, you know, in the lab, the conditions are very artificial, which in those experiments that we did now, fish have the chance to occupy. Yeah, microhabitats are similar to what they would do in nature and also feed on different diets. So I think, yeah, I want to um, advocate for um, performing such experiments under as naturalistic conditions as possible. And while this is, and I would see the results as very exciting, but only as a starting point. So everything I showed you was strictly correlative. And I think it's a good point to, um, to perform follow up studies. One thing I'm currently thinking about is maybe to do gut microbiota manipulation experiments where we, for example, take the material communities of a, the fastest and the slowest growing fish and inoculate germ free fish with those um, bacterial communities and see whether they're, you know, which the, whether the, um, the similarity and difference in microbial communities can actually affect growth rate. With this, uh, I'd like to finish my talk. I'd like to thank my co authors, um, Diana Renison, my supervisor. Ken Thompson and Dolph Schluter, the Renison Lab, and my funding source, which is the German Research Foundation. And yes, I hope there's time for a few questions. And thanks for your um, yeah, for watching my talk. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we do have time for a question or two. Uh, anybody have questions? Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, Taichi, please go ahead. Yeah, great talk. Um, uh, maybe I missed this, but how are you measuring the growth rate? And, and are you considering, um, are you accounting for sex and age? So the growth rate, um, so the fish were weighed before and after the experiment, and they were tagged with individual um, individual tags. So, you know, we could recover like the, the initial and the final weight for each fish. And then, um, we used some, some linear models to um, measure growth rate. We accounted for, again, same like in the other models, we accounted for differences in, in lake and pond. We did not include sex here in this, in this model, but that's actually a good point. Um, like when I dissected the fish, I, I sexed most of them, but I did not look at um, sex effects at this point. But yeah, that's definitely something I should probably check. Yeah. And the fish were pretty much all the same age. And there were also no differences in body size, or also, sorry, in weight before the experiment between like the low and the high fitness fish. So there couldn't be any effect of this. And also there's not an effect of age, yeah. But um, yeah, sex effects, that, that's a good point, thank you. I mean, I'll... I'll ask a question being not at all a fish guy. Um, how do you do microbiome manipulations in, in your systems? So I haven't done it yet. There's a few studies. So one thing would be you have an antibiotic cocktail and you leave fish like in a, in a small container over, overnight and you put like the antibiotics in the water, leave them in there. Um, and then the next day, you just inoculate with uh, some chopped up guts from um, some donor fish. But that's yes, basically adding the antibiotics to the water. So, I mean, as I said germ-free, which is probably, you know, I don't know if they will really be germ-free, but you'll definitely disrupt the microbiota and reduce the abundance of bacteria. Absolutely. That's similar to mice, right? Where you, where you whack them with antibiotics and then, and then you know, feed them something else. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you very much for your talk. Um, so uh, we now have a gap in our... Um, Post parasite session. Our next speaker was un unable to make it today, but we so we have a fifteen minute gap, and then at um, I guess four thirty Mountain Time, uh, we do have one more speaker, Sonia. So please do um, you know either wait the fifteen minutes or go see another talk, and then and then come on back for for four thirty. Um, so we'll see you then. Thank you. Let's put up the the rotating slides for now.
So we've got a minute or so. We'll give we uh, we don't have a, a last speaker in the session, so we'll start at like you know a minute or two late to give people some time to trickle back in. Uh, uh, but Sonia, you can share your slides any any time you want. Great. Yeah, so let's give it a couple minutes and then. All right, well, welcome back, everybody, um, for the final talk of our host parasite session. Um, Sonia, whenever you're ready. Great, thank you. And uh, thanks to everyone for coming to this session of host parasites and uh, for waiting out the pause if you were doing that as well. My name is Sonia Singhal. I'm an assistant professor at San Jose State University in California. I'm going to be talking about a parasite of bacteria called bacteriophages and specifically the work that my lab has done to characterize the host range and infection dynamics of a wild bacteriophage isolate. Um, our lab is predominantly undergraduate run at the moment, so I want to start by crediting the students who actually collected the data that I'm going to be presenting today. Um, Akiko uh, acted as the project head as a senior undergraduate and will be continuing with us as a graduate student. Um, two other current undergraduates, Edward and Irvin, um, helped collect a lot of the data that I'll present, and a former undergraduate, Karen, helped bring the system into the lab and get it started. Our lab is funded by San Jose State University and also the NIH. One of the most pressing problems of our modern era is the rise of bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. The CDC estimated in 2019 that there were 2.8 million antibiotic resistant infections and 35,000 deaths. And uh, that number has only increased since then. You also hear in the news occasional reports of bacteria that are resistant to as many as 26 different antibiotics. What this means in practical terms is that we are in an era where it is possible to get a minor cut or injury and gain an infection of a bacterium that we do not have the ability to treat. A potential solution to this problem is to use bacteriophages, also called phages. Um, I have an image electron micrograph of a one type of bacteriophage on the right here. This is a tailed phage. Bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria, and as part of their infection process, they often kill their host cell. They could be very useful to use um, medicinally because they are not pathogenic to humans. They are extremely numerous. We think there are 10 to the power of 31 phages on this planet. And they're also incredibly diverse with a huge number of different genome types and also infection mechanisms. However, using bacteriophages also poses some problems. And the ones that I'm going to focus on related to our work are um, first that they tend to be highly specific to their host cells. If you want to cure a bacterial infection using a bacteriophage, you need to find a specific phage that can infect that bacterium. And the other challenge is that we have genome sequences for more than 8,000 phages right now, but a relatively small fraction of those have actually been characterized beyond their genome sequence. And knowing something about the biology of these phages may actually help us use them effectively as medicine treatments. The bacteriophage that I will be discussing was isolated by our collaborators, Dr. Wendy Lee, Dr. Stephen White, and Dr. Rob Fowler from the Santa Clara Valley Waste Treatment Center in Santa Clara, California. They isolated it on E. coli B, and they found that when they put it on petri dishes, it made a kind of unusual phenotype. Um, so this is a 
an image of part of a Petri dish. The yellow background is the E. coli B host as a lawn. And then the darker circles within that are where the bacteriophages are growing. These are where the bacteriophages are killing the host. So essentially you're seeing the absence of the bacterial host cells. And for this particular phage, um, they noticed that the plaques, these darker spots, had often a lighter halo surrounding a darker center. And for this reason, they colloquially named their bacteriophage halophage. They sequenced the halophage and found that it had a linear double-stranded DNA genome of about 40,000 base pairs comprising 62 open reading frames. And it shared a 93.8% similarity with a very well-studied laboratory bacteriophage T7. The genome sequence gives us a little bit of information about how we might expect this bacteriophage to infect hosts. But our lab wanted to actually evaluate this empirically and specifically look at how many other hosts can this bacteriophage infect and what are the dynamics of its infection. So I'll start with the host range. This could be important uh, medically because you want to know what kinds of bacterial diseases this phage could potentially help treat. The way we run these experiments is by taking the bacterial host of interest, plating it on a petri dish as a lawn, and then adding dilutions of the pure phage called a lysate as drops on top of that bacterial lawn. We tested a variety of different hosts, including both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, and also several species that are common in the gut microbiome. And we found that the halophage could, in addition to infecting its isolation host, E. coli B, it could also infect E. coli K. So you can see over here the formation of plaques that indicates that the phage was able to infect this bacterial host. It was not able to infect any of the other bacterial hosts that we tried, and I have an example image here of Enterobacter aerogenase, um, which shows no indication of plaque formation. So this tells us that uh, the halophage is most likely specific to E. coli and could potentially be used um, in E. coli infections. Now that we know a little bit about what hosts it can infect, the next question is how exactly does that infection process work for this bacteriophage? Here, what we are doing is taking, again, the pure phages, adding them into their bacterial host. And in this case, we use the isolation host, E. coli B. And then uh, at different points in time, we take samples from this mixed culture and plate them out on petri dishes to count how many bacteriophages are present in the sample at that time. Um, the data are shown here. So I have on the x-axis the time of sampling in minutes, starting from when the bacteria and the phages were combined. And on the y-axis is the concentration of phages in the sample at that time. It's on a log base 10 scale for ease of visualization. We took four replicates, two replicates in two different blocks, which is why you see the different colors as well. What we first notice is that initially there is a relatively even concentration. The concentration is not changing very much. This corresponds to what we call the latent period. During this time period, the bacteriophages are attaching to their host cell, injecting their genetic material, and replicating themselves. In the halophage, this lasts about 23 and a third minutes. We then see an increase in concentration of the bacteriophages. What's happening here is that the bacteriophages have matured and they're going to burst or lice open their host to release the new phages into the environment. That happens at the end of the latent period. So that is again set to 23.38 minutes for halophage. We can also determine from these data approximately how many new phages are produced per infection. And for the halophage, that is approximately 35 to 36 on average new viral particles per infection. This kind of information, in addition to helping to establish the phage's biology, could also be used medicinally if we are interested in, for example, how large of doses of the phage should we add or are there particular timings that we should use between doses. One parameter that the data we collected in this experiment could not tell us about, but that is important for phage biology, is the specific attachment time. So how long does it take the, ba the bacteriophage to find and infect its host cell? To look at this in more detail, we ran a second experiment. Here, we're taking advantage of the fact that bacteriophages that have attached to bacteria 
can be separated out with the bacteria. So we take our phage lysate, um, the pure phages, we combine them with the host bacteria. And then instead of sampling and plating directly to count the phages, we have a dilution step where the culture is um, diluted and that stops the attachment or absorption of the phage by essentially separating them out from their host cells. We can then centrifuge down that sample to collect all of the bacteria in the pellet and any phages that have attached or absorbed to the bacterial cells will be in the pellet as well. And we sample from the supernatant where we should only find free unattached phages. We did this experiment both um, with samples that contained the host bacterium, E. coli B, and we also ran a control experiment that uh, used phages in media instead. So here again in this graph, I have the time of sampling on the x-axis and the y-axis shows us of the number of phages that we originally added to this culture, how many of them are left as free unattached phages in the solution at the time of sampling. The blue boxes represent our control sample, which was added into media. We do not see a change in the concentration of phages in these samples because there are no host cells. The phages are inert, they cannot grow. In the samples that had bacterial cells, we start with uh, the phages that we added. And then by our first sampling time point at five minutes, the concentration of free unattached phages has decreased to about 20%. So this tells us that the halophage is able to attach to its host cell within the first five minutes um, of experiencing that addition to the host cell. So to summarize what we found out about this bacteria phage, um, it has a host range that most likely includes E. coli species. It can attach very rapidly to its host cell, most likely within about one and a half to five minutes. And uh, as we hammer down the attachment time more precisely, we'll also revise the latent period and the burst time based on the numbers we have right now. It bursts in about 23.38 minutes and produces uh, on average 35 to 36 viral particles per infection. There are things that we would like to uh, continue to refine in our measurements. So as I mentioned before, what is the precise absorption time? We'll look at this by taking time points um, prior to five minutes. We saw that halophage could not infect more distantly related bacteria from E. coli, such as Enterobacter, but it may be able to infect closer relatives, such as Salmonella. This is something we would like to explore. And then we're also interested in looking more specifically at what receptor the halophage uses to attach to its host cell, which may also give us clues as to uh, what other hosts it is able to infect. Stepping back and thinking about things more broadly, now that we have both a genotype and some phenotypic information for the bacteriophage, we can start to look at questions such as what are the genetic underpinnings of the infection characteristics that we observe in the halophage? And are there ways that we can alter or optimize those infection dynamics, either by growing the halophage in a different environment or potentially evolving it in a different environment? I'd like again to credit the students who did this work in my laboratory and our funders, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, questions? Uh, yes, yeah, Stephen. Hi, um, I really enjoyed your talk. I've, I'm curious about something. Is it possible for phage to develop resist or to, for bacteria to develop resistance to phage? It is indeed. It is extremely common. <laughs> However, phages also evolve. So there is some potential that the bacteriophage itself can then evolve in turn to reinfect the resistant bacterium. Okay, thank you. Yes. I have a question as well. Sure. What would be if you, it's sort of an optimal host range if you wanted to use a phage as a therapeutic, you know, super specific, super broad, somewhere in between? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, the specificity of phages themselves has been used as an argument for why we should use them medicinally, because antibiotics, for example, have very broad targets, and you can take out 
gut microbiome, gut microbes that are beneficial to you, as well as ones that are disease causing. That may be less likely in the case of bacteriophages. So that's um, one thing for the positive. But on the negative side, you do have to find phages that actually infect the bacterium that you're looking at. And that can be a, a very intensive and time consuming process. Um, there are consortiums, um, what is the thing called? The C phages program does this in classrooms. So that is one of the reasons that we have been able to sequence so many different types of phages because we're bringing this into the classroom and doing it with students. I say we, uh, I'm not part of this consortium, I should say, <laughs> but I really admire their work. <laughs>